Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, a production of catholicculture.org and under the patronage of St. John Henry Newman. Today's reading, On the Annunciation, found in Meditations and Devotions, written by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski. Mary is the Regina Angelorum, the Queen of Angels. This great title may be fitly connected with the maternity of Mary, that is, with the coming upon her of the Holy Ghost at Nazareth after the angel Gabriel's annunciation to her, and with the consequent birth of our Lord at Bethlehem. She, as the mother of our Lord, comes nearer to him than any angel, nearer even than the seraphim who surround him and cry continually, Holy, Holy, Holy. The two archangels who have a special office in the gospel are St. Michael and St. Gabriel, and they, both of them, are associated in the history of the Incarnation with Mary, St. Gabriel when the Holy Ghost came down upon her, and St. Michael when the Divine Child was born. St. Gabriel hailed her as full of grace and as blessed among women, and announced to her that the Holy Ghost would come down upon her and that she would bear a son who would be the son of the highest. Of St. Michael's ministry to her on the birth of that divine son, we learn in the Apocalypse, written by the Apostle St. John. We know our Lord came to set up the kingdom of heaven among men, and hardly was he born when he was assaulted by the powers of the world who wished to destroy him. Herod sought to take his life, but he was defeated by St. Joseph's carrying his mother and him off into Egypt. But St. John in the Apocalypse tells us that Michael and his angels were the real guardians of mother and child, then and on other occasions. First, St. John saw in vision a great sign in heaven, meaning by heaven the church or kingdom of God, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And when she was about to be delivered of her child, there appeared a great red dragon, that is, the evil spirit, ready to devour her son when he should be born. The son was preserved by his own divine power, but next the evil spirit persecuted her. St. Michael, however, and his angels came to the rescue and prevailed against him. There was a great battle, says the sacred writer. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and that great dragon was cast out, the old serpent, who is called the devil. Now, as then, the Blessed Mother of God has hosts of angels who do her service, and she is their queen. Mary is the Speculum Justitiae, the mirror of justice. Here first we must consider what is meant by justice, for the word as used by the church has not that sense which it bears in ordinary English. By justice is not meant the virtue of fairness, equity, uprightness in our dealings, but it is a word denoting all virtues at once, a perfect, virtuous state of soul, righteousness or moral perfection, so that it answers very nearly to what is meant by sanctity. Therefore, when Our Lady is called the mirror of justice, it is meant to say that she is the mirror of sanctity, holiness, supernatural goodness. Next, what is meant by calling her a mirror? A mirror is a surface which reflects, as still water, polished steel, or a looking glass. What did Mary reflect? She reflected our Lord. But He is infinite sanctity. She then, as far as a creature could, reflected His divine sanctity, and therefore she is the mirror of sanctity, or, as the litany says, of justice. Do we ask how she came to reflect His sanctity? It was by living with Him. We see every day how like people get to each other who live with those they love. When they live with those whom they don't love, 
as for instance the members of a family who quarrel with each other, then the longer they live together, the more unlike each other they become. But when they love each other, as husband and wife, parents and children, brothers with brothers or sisters, friends with friends, then in course of time they get surprisingly like each other. All of us perceive this. We are witnesses to it with our own eyes and ears, in the expression of their features, in their voice, in their walk, in their language, even in their handwriting, they become like each other. And so with regard to their minds, as in their opinions, their tastes, their pursuits, and again, doubtless, in the state of their souls, which we do not see, whether for good or for bad. Now consider that Mary loved her divine son with an unutterable love, and consider too she had him all to herself for thirty years. Do we not see that, as she was full of grace before she conceived him in her womb, she must have had a vast, incomprehensible sanctity when she had lived close to God for thirty years, a sanctity of an angelical order, reflecting back the attributes of God with a fullness and exactness of which no saint upon earth, or hermit or holy virgin, can even remind us. Truly then, she is the speculum justitiae, the mirror of divine perfection. Mary is the sedes sapientiae, the seat of wisdom. Mary has this title in her litany because the Son of God, who is also called in Scripture the Word and Wisdom of God, once dwelt in her, and then, after his birth of her, was carried in her arms and seated in her lap in his first years. Thus being, as it were, the human throne of him who reigns in heaven, she is called the seat of wisdom. In the poet's words, His throne, thy bosom blessed, O mother undefiled, that throne, if aught beneath the skies, beseems the sinless child. But the possession of her son lasted beyond his infancy. He was under her rule, as St. Luke tells us, and lived with her in her house till he went forth to preach, that is, for at least a whole thirty years. And this brings us to a reflection about her, cognate to that which was suggested to us by the title of Mirror of Justice. For if such close and continued intimacy with her son created in her a sanctity inconceivably great, must not also the knowledge which she gained during those many years from his conversation of present, past, and future have been so large and so profound and so diversified and so thorough that though she was a poor woman without human advantages, she must in her knowledge of creation, of the universe, and of history have excelled the greatest of philosophers, and in her theological knowledge the greatest of theologians, and in her prophetic discernment the most favored of prophets. What was the grand theme of conversation between her and her son but the nature, the attributes, the providence and the works of Almighty God. Would not our Lord be ever glorifying the Father who sent Him? Would He not unfold to her the solemn eternal decrees and the purposes and will of God? Would He not from time to time enlighten her in all those points of doctrine which have been first discussed and then settled in the church from the time of the apostles till now, and all that shall be till the end? Nay, these, and far more than these, all that is obscure, all that is fragmentary in revelation would, so far as the knowledge is possible to man, be brought out to her in clearness and simplicity by him who is the light of the world. And so of the events which are to come. God spoke to the prophets. We have his communications to them in scripture. But he spoke to them in figure and parable. There was one, Moses, to whom he vouchsafed to speak face to face. If there be among you a prophet of the Lord, God says, I will appear to him in a vision, and I will speak to him in a dream. But it is not so with my servant Moses, for I will speak to him mouth to mouth, and plainly, and not by riddles and figures doth he see the Lord. This was the great privilege of the inspired lawgiver of the Jews, 
but how much was it below that of Mary? Moses had the privilege only now and then, from time to time, but Mary, for thirty continuous years, saw and heard him, being all through that time face to face with him, and being able to ask him any question which she wished explained, and knowing that the answers she received were from the eternal God, who neither deceives nor can be deceived. Mary is the Yanua Cheli, the Gate of Heaven. Mary is called the Gate of Heaven because it was through her that our Lord passed from heaven to earth. The prophet Ezekiel, prophesying of Mary, says, The gate shall be closed, it shall not be opened, and no man shall pass through it, since the Lord God of Israel has entered through it, and it shall be closed for the prince, the prince himself shall sit in it. Now this is fulfilled, not only in our Lord having taken flesh from her and being her son, but, moreover, in that she had a place in the economy of redemption. It is fulfilled in her spirit and will as well as in her body. Eve had a part in the fall of man, though it was Adam who was our representative and whose sin made us sinners. It was Eve who began and who tempted Adam. Scripture says, The woman saw that the tree was good to eat and fair to the eyes and delightful to behold, and she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband, and he did eat. It was fitting then in God's mercy that as the woman began the destruction of the world, so woman should also begin its recovery, and that as Eve opened the way for the fatal deed of the first Adam, so Mary should open the way for the great achievement of the second Adam, even our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to save the world by dying on the cross for it. Hence Mary is called by the Holy Fathers a second and a better Eve, as having taken that first step in the salvation of mankind which Eve took in its ruin. How and when did Mary take part, and the initial part, in the world's restoration? It was when the angel Gabriel came to her to announce to her the great dignity which was to be her portion. St. Paul bids us present our bodies to God as a reasonable service. We must not only pray with our lips and fast and do outward penance and be chaste in our bodies, but we must be obedient and pure in our minds. And so, as regards the Blessed Virgin, it was God's will that she should undertake willingly and with full understanding, to be the mother of our Lord, and not to be a mere passive instrument whose maternity would have no merit and no reward. The higher our gifts, the heavier our duties. It was no light lot to be so intimately near to the Redeemer of men, as she experienced afterwards when she suffered with him. Therefore, weighing well the angel's words before giving her answer to them, First she asked whether so great an office would be a forfeiture of that virginity which she had vowed. When the angel told her no, then, with the full consent of a full heart, full of God's love to her and her own loneliness, she said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. It was by this consent that she became the gate of heaven. Mary is the Mater Creatoris, the Mother of the Creator. This is a title which, of all others, we should have thought it impossible for any creature to possess. At first sight we might be tempted to say that it throws into confusion our primary ideas of the Creator and the creature, the eternal and the temporal, the self-subsisting and the dependent. And yet on further consideration, we shall see that we cannot refuse the title to Mary without denying the divine incarnation, that is, the great and fundamental truth of revelation, that God became man. And this was seen from the first age of the church. Christians were accustomed from the first to call the Blessed Virgin the Mother of God, because they saw that it was impossible to deny her that title without denying St. John's words, the Word, 
that is, God the Son, was made flesh. And in no long time it was found necessary to proclaim this truth by the voice of an ecumenical council of the church. For in consequence of the dislike which men have of a mystery, the error sprang up that our Lord was not really God, but a man, differing from us in this merely, that God dwelt in him, as God dwells in all good men, only in a higher measure, as the Holy Spirit dwelt in angels and prophets, as in a sort of temple, or again as our Lord now dwells in the tabernacle and church. And then the bishops and faithful people found there was no other way of hindering this false, bad view being taught, but by declaring distinctly, and making it a point of faith, that Mary was the mother not of man only, but of God. And since that time the title of Mary as Mother of God has become what is called a dogma or article of faith in the Church. But this leads us to a larger view of the subject. Is this title as given to Mary more wonderful than the doctrine that God, without ceasing to be God, should become man? Is it more mysterious that Mary should be Mother of God than that God should be man? Yet the latter, as I have said, is the elementary truth of revelation witnessed by prophets, evangelists, and apostles all through Scripture. And what can be more consoling and joyful than the wonderful promises which follow from this truth that Mary is the mother of God, the great wonder, namely, that we become the brethren of our God, that if we live well and die in the grace of God, we shall, all of us, hereafter be taken up by our incarnate God to that place where angels dwell, that our bodies shall be raised from the dust and be taken to heaven, that we shall be really united to God, that we shall be partakers of the divine nature, that each of us, soul and body, shall be plunged into the abyss of glory which surrounds the Almighty that we shall see him and share his blessedness, according to the text, Whosoever shall do the will of my Father that is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Mary is the Mater Christi, the Mother of Christ. Each of the titles of Mary has its own special meaning and drift, and may be made the subject of a distinct meditation. She is invoked by us as the mother of Christ. What is the force of thus addressing her? It is to bring before us that she it is whom from the first was prophesied of and associated with the hopes and prayers of all holy men, of all true worshippers of God, of all who looked for the redemption of Israel in every age before that redemption came. Our Lord was called the Christ or the Messiah by the Jewish prophets and the Jewish people. The two words Christ and Messiah mean the same. They mean in English, the anointed. In the old time there were three great ministries or offices by means of which God spoke to his chosen people, the Israelites, or as they were afterward called, the Jews. That of priest, that of king, and that of prophet. Those who were chosen by God for one or other of these offices were solemnly anointed with oil, oil signifying the grace of God which was given to them for the due performance of their high duties. But our Lord was all three, a priest, a prophet, and a king, a priest because he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, a prophet because he revealed to us the holy law of God, and a king because he rules over us. Thus he is the one true Christ. It was in expectation of this great Messiah that the chosen people, the Jews or Israelites or Hebrews, for these are different names for the same people, looked out from age to age. He was to come to set all things right. And next to this great question which occupied their minds, namely, when was he to come, was the question, who was to be his mother? It had been told them from the first, not that he should come from heaven, but that he should be born of a woman. At the time of the fall of Adam, God had said that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. 
Who then was to be that woman thus significantly pointed out to the fallen race of Adam? At the end of many centuries, it was further revealed to the Jews that the great Messiah, or Christ, the seed of the woman, should be born of their race and of one particular tribe of the twelve tribes into which that race was divided. From that time, every woman of that tribe hoped to have the great privilege of herself being the mother of the Messiah, or Christ. For it stood to reason, since he was so great, the mother must be great, and good, and blessed too. Hence it was, among other reasons, that they thought so highly of the marriage state, because, not knowing the mystery of the miraculous conception of the Christ when he was actually to come, they thought that the marriage rite was the ordinance necessary for his coming. Hence it was, if Mary had been as other women, she would have longed for marriage as opening on her the prospect of bearing the great king. But she was too humble and too pure for such thoughts. She had been inspired to choose that better way of serving God which had not been made known to the Jews, the state of virginity. She preferred to be his spouse to being his mother. Accordingly, when the angel Gabriel announced to her her high destiny, she shrank from it till she was assured that it would not oblige her to revoke her purpose of a virgin life devoted to her God. Thus was it that she became the mother of the Christ, not in that way which pious women for so many ages had expected him, but, declining the grace of such maternity, she gained it by means of a higher grace. And this is the full meaning of St. Elizabeth's words when the Blessed Virgin came to visit her, which we use in the Hail Mary. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And therefore it is that in the devotion called the crown of twelve stars, we give praise to God the Holy Ghost, through whom she was both virgin and mother. Mary is the Mater Salvatoris, the mother of the Savior. Here again we must understand what is meant by calling our Lord a Savior in order to understand why it is used to form one of the titles given to Mary in her litany. The special name by which our Lord was known before his coming was, as we found, that of Messiah, or Christ. Thus he was known to the Jews. But when he actually showed himself on earth, he was known by three new titles, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the Savior. The first expressive of his divine nature the second of his human, the third of his personal office. Thus the angel who appeared to Mary called him the Son of God. The angel who appeared to Joseph called him Jesus, which means in English, Savior. And so the angels too called him a Savior when they appeared to the shepherds. But he himself specially calls himself the Son of Man. Not angels only call him Savior, but those two greatest of the apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, in their first preachings. St. Peter says he is a prince and a savior, and St. Paul says a savior, Jesus. And both angels and apostles tell us why he is so called. Because he has rescued us from the power of the evil spirit and from the guilt and misery of our sins. Thus the angel says to Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And St. Peter, God has exalted him to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and remission of sins. And he says himself, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now let us consider how this affects our thoughts of Mary. To rescue slaves from the power of the enemy implies a conflict. Our Lord, because he was a savior, was a warrior. He could not deliver the captives without a fight, nor without personal suffering. Now, who are they who especially hate wars? A heathen poet answers. Wars, he says, are hated by mothers. Mothers are just those who especially suffer in a war. They may glory in the honor gained by their children, 
but still such glorying does not wipe out one particle of the long pain, the anxiety, the suspense, the desolation and the anguish which the mother of a soldier feels. So it was with Mary. For thirty years she was blessed with the continual presence of her son. Nay, she had him in subjection. But the time came when that war called for him for which he had come upon earth. Certainly he came not simply to be the son of Mary, but to be the savior of man. And therefore at length he parted from her. She knew then what it was to be the mother of a soldier. He left her side. She saw him no longer. She tried in vain to get near him. He had for years lived in her embrace, and after that at least in her dwelling. But now, in his own words, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then, when years had run out, she heard of his arrest, his mock trial, and his passion. At last she got near him. When and where? On the way to Calvary, and when he had been lifted upon the cross. And at length she held him again in her arms. Yes when he was dead. True, he rose from the dead, but still she did not thereby gain him, for he ascended on high, and she did not at once follow him. No, she remained on earth many years, in the care indeed of his dearest apostle St. John, but what was even the holiest of men compared with her own son, and him the son of God? O holy Mary! Mother of our Savior, in this meditation we have now suddenly passed from the joyful mysteries to the sorrowful, from Gabriel's annunciation to thee to the seven dollars. That, then, will be the next series of meditations which we make about thee. This has been On the Annunciation, found in Meditations and Devotions, written by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski, production copyright 2021 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is brought to you by catholicculture.org and made possible by listener support. To donate, please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio.